Okay, well, I hit stop. I, yeah. Okay. Hey, everybody. How's it going? If anybody's there, give us some shout outs. continuation last week but uh, let's not start right away let's give people some time to show up um, I guess I could go over some mis a mistake I made last time uh, the word is yeah let me, let me look at it real quick make sure I <laughs> Yeah, I said the word was tai taifu, but it's actually taifu. Or maybe in Taiwan it's tai taifu, but I, I don't really know because I don't. I've never heard anybody say that word before. <laughs> I don't actually use it either, which is why I didn't remember the tone. But for anyone wondering why da also is pronounced tai. Uh, keep in mind that in Cantonese, it's always, it's pronounced Dai. So the, actually a Da, I think is unusual. I think it's supposed to have an I at the end of it. Um, you guys uh, checked out the system data yet? It's pretty cool. It's pretty satisfying after having, the, having wanted that data for so long to actually have it in Plico is really cool. <laughs> So, <clears throat> guess uh, if nobody's got any questions, I'll go ahead and start. the mic still plugged in on my phone from a call. So hopefully it sounds better now. There's a delay so that always makes fixing problems a little bit delayier. Alright, well this still may not be 100% smooth, but it should be a lot smoother than last week. Um, yeah, the, we had a lot of technical issues last week. Um, I'm going to actually, so to start out, what I'm going to do is kind of do a, a very quick read kind of go over what we did last week and what we're going to go over today. Uh, huh. Sorry, technical difficulty here. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay. <clears throat> so let me. I'm, I need to do an audio test here. And believe it or not, we actually were testing this beforehand. We didn't just turn it on. Uh, but we didn't, I guess, get all the issues out. Uh, just waiting on the delay right now. So we can see if mic's working correctly. Um, yeah, I'm just waiting on the... Okay, so apparently our mic is working, we're good to go. Let's get into this thing. <clears throat> so to recap, like what we talked about last week, um, well, to give an overview, you know, how do we know what ancient versions of Chinese sounded like? Uh, there's basically four, four things that we can Four types, uh, I guess, evidence, although not strictly speaking, all of them aren't actually evidence. But anyway, so basically four types of evidence. One of them is explicit data, as whereas in some ancient book, a person is saying this, this character sounds like this character. And when you get into the Middle Chinese period, uh, well, early, early Middle Chinese around 600 AD, late Middle Chinese uh, around you know, three or four hundred years after that, you start getting very explicit information. Uh, this, you know, that the the initial of a of a given character has a certain uh, place of articulation in the mouth that that it's articulated in a certain way. Uh, you know what the rhyme the rhyme is, and all all, all kind of stuff. So it gets very explicit later on. Um, so the challenge is then to um, reconstruct things from a much earlier period and when you do that you have this other stuff that we go by well I mean you use this explicit data as well but the explicit data that we covered last week is basically rhyme books, rhyme tables, sound glosses, uh, dictionaries and fan qie and du ruo are actually basically types of well types of sound glosses um, so today we want to go over first-hand evidence and first-hand evidence is when you see characters used a certain way in a text. So the the person who's doing the writing isn't explicitly telling you this character is pronounced like that character, but they might be using character A to write uh, what you normally use character B to write. So you know that A and B have to either mean the same thing or they have to have the same sound. And uh, almost always they're switched out via sound and not via meaning. Uh, and that's called Tong jia. and tong, tong, tong jia, I'm going to go into it in detail in a minute, but it's very it's very extensive in ancient texts. I mean, there's I, I say tons. I, I don't know how many dictionaries there are on tong, tong jia, but I, I've personally seen at least 15 or 20, and they're usually really thick dictionaries. Uh, so if you want to see uh, the, why do we have dictionaries like that? So if you want to see this character if you want to see what other characters get used to write that word in ancient texts, you can look it up in this dictionary and it'll say, well, in this text, uh, character B gets used for this character A, or in that other text, character C gets used for this character A, that kind of thing. Uh, and this this is very similar to probably you've heard of the traditional uh, Liu Shu, uh, Liu Shu meaning the six ways of writing. Uh, there's one of them called jia jie, and jia jie is where you're borrowing one. You, there was a character that was invented for a different word, and it gets borrowed to write a new word. Um, then you have xie sheng, and xie sheng is the sound relationship between a character and its sound component, if it has one. So if it has a sound component, the relationship between that sound component and the character itself, or you could even think of it as 
uh, all the characters in a certain sound series, that's that's called xie sheng or you know harmonizing sounds in Chinese. Uh, other first-hand data includes proper foreign names annotated in Chinese text, so names of other countries, of people from other countries, etc., place names. Uh, you have variant characters, so most people get the impression that character evolution is a linear process, and, and it can be, but usually it's not. Usually there might be two or three different characters, if not five versions of that character. I say versions of that character, five different characters that are used to write the same spoken word. Um, yeah, so... Sorry, there's like a... Let me, let me ask a question to John real quick. <clears throat> yeah, so basically John's telling me the mic isn't loud enough, so let me see if I can turn it up. Okay, here's... Mike appears to be. Oh man. Uh, hold on a second. Big problem. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I just noticed the computer wasn't plugged in, so we would have been we would have dropped out suddenly. Um, okay, so I'm trying to see if I can turn up my microphone. Just turn up the microphone boost. See if that works. Uh... <clears throat> okay, so while I'm waiting to hear back from John, I'll just go ahead and keep going on this. Um... So yeah, so variant characters are characters created uh, the, basically, the definition of variant is the characters look different. Or they might have a different sound component or a different semantic component, but they're created to represent the same spoken word. And because they're created to represent the same spoken word, we know that uh, the sounds will be the same. So if there's a different sound component that tells us something about the relationship between those two sound components and the relation to that word. Um, so that's why variant characters are important. Then you also have rhyming text, uh, poetry. So for example, most of what we know about old Chinese rhyming has to do with the rhyming in the Shi Jing, which is uh, a book of poetry written across a 700 year period. 
we also have textual variants. So that means there's like an ancient text that gets quoted by another text and then they change the text a little bit. And sometimes they do this in such a way that reveals sound relationships between words or characters. You have dialect studies. So earlier, you know, modern, even modern dialects, but modern versions of Chinese uh, have evolved from ancient versions of Chinese. So by comparing, by well, by categorizing the sounds of dialects with their region and then comparing them to each other, we can project back in time as to what sounds uh, the modern sounds evolved from. Uh, we have information. Well, we know how characters are used in dialects in modern Chinese. So, for instance, in Cantonese, uh, which I'll go over later, in Cantonese, there's like a basically a rule that if you're writing the way you speak as opposed to writing standard Chinese, uh, if you're writing the way you speak and you don't know how to write a certain sound you're trying to say, you pick a character that has the same sound and same tone, and then you just you use that instead of the original. So that's a type of tong tongjia. Uh, then you have really complicated uh, scenarios like you do with with minanhua or Taiwanese or Taiyu, depending on who you ask. So. We're, we're gonna get try to get through these first hand the first hand data today it took like much longer than I anticipated last time to do the explicit data uh, if we get through first hand data then I'll after that I'll go I'll give you an overview of the second hand data but basically there's four types there's explicit data first hand data second hand data which is basically not from not internal to Chinese but say Chinese loan words into other languages surrounding China or or the other way around, loan words from these other languages into Chinese. Uh, you also have the fact that Chinese characters were borrowed into other languages like Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese. And then also looking at the phonology of languages around China should give you an idea of what, basically what the sound, sounds in Chinese are most likely like. It doesn't tell us exactly, but it gives us an idea. And then the last main category is using analysis and logic. And there, there's a lot to that, and it's, those are some very powerful tools available to us. Um, so let's just get into, I guess, second-hand data. No, first-hand data. Okay. <clears throat> so I talked about tong, tong jia, which is borrowing a character for its sound. And I mean, this, this actually gets used in, in modern Chinese. Uh, to write foreign place names. Well, it's, it's, it's more of a fixed tone. Well, I actually, so you have a place name, right? Like take Malaysia, like in Taiwan, they say Malai, Malaysia. I think in China, they say Malaysia, Malaysia. But in Taiwan, most people say Malaysia. And you use the character Ma for horse. Lai, come, Xi, West, and Ya, or Ya, for like Asia, basically. But when you're using the character, it has nothing to do with any of these meanings. It's simply a sound symbol at this point, which is what tong, basically what tong tong jia is. Though it can be in, in a more, <clears throat> like Malaysia is pretty much always written that way, though probably very early on in, when they first started having contact with Malaysia, it wasn't written in a single way. If you look at, if you read Chinese news, and you'll notice when a new um, political figure comes on the scene, like for me, like I remember when Obama became president, uh, you saw several different ways of writing Obama in the very beginning when, when he first started running for president. And then once he became president, people just kind of settled on a single way of writing his name. Uh, that's... That's basically tong, the beginning there was tong jia. They're just using sound, the characters as pure sound symbols in a kind of a free sense that they're not fixed. And then 
for for whatever reasons people start copying maybe maybe they copy um, the more popular journal journalists or maybe it's from a more reputable newspaper or maybe the government comes up with a way of writing it I, I don't know how that works actually I just I just know that you in the beginning a new political figure appears you start seeing several ways of writing their name and then within a few weeks you'll st it'll start converging onto one way of writing the name um, <clears throat> so that's that's the basics of kind of Tongjia and probably people underestimate like how incredibly common this was in preaching texts uh, so I have an entry here from from a Tongjia dictionary and this is the entry for Zhang Uh, actually, that's sort of true. This, okay, sorry. Let me let me read it out loud. Somebody made a comment. Cantonese has a very useful thing where they put a ko component on the tongjia to indicate that it's a spoken word instead of a visual usual character, which makes it easier to understand. That 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 actually predates Cantonese. Um, that ha that's that's been going on for well over maybe minimum a thousand years probably 1500 years if not longer and a lot of the times in Cantonese when they use that it's not that it's not the case usually that Cantonese speakers taking a character and then adding a ko to it it's usually the case that that character already existed and then they're borrowing that character with the ko uh, <clears throat> Though it's possible that the Cantonese invented some characters that way. Um, Dr. Bauer, Robert Bauer, he does a lot of this stuff on Cantonese. And he actually has a monologue that you can order. I think it's from the, the Journal of Chinese Linguistics where he actually lists a thousand or two thousand Cantonese characters. Where Cantonese characters is either a character invented for Cantonese or a character that's already existed already exists but is used differently in Cantonese um, then Don Snow also wrote a book on written Cantonese uh, so if you I mean it sounds like you whoever made the comment it sounds like you got you, you read Cantonese um, so you probably already know a bit about maybe even know those two sources but if you want to know more about it and you haven't read those sources I, I recommend them uh, yeah, they, they, I, I know Dr. Bauer, for him, Cantonese is a lifelong passion. Um, he also has an ABC dictionary of Cantonese. Uh, I'm a big fan of Cantonese, so... <laughs> uh, but yeah, this putting a ko on something is actually... I mean, you could even make the case that this goes back to Oracle Bone script, because there's a lot of, like... There's a lot of times where ko gets used as... We in, in paleography you call it a, a descriptive or no sorry. Fun in, in Chinese is called fun fun hua fu hao. A, for, a distinct a distinctive mark. I, I don't I don't usually read this in English so. Um, although in, the, in our dictionary we talk about it in English so I do have a concept of how to talk about it. But anyway I think it's called a distinctive mark so you take. Like the character Gao, meaning tall, that ko at the bottom was actually added to Beijing, the Jing, because uh, it was originally a picture of a tall building. They added a ko to the bottom to dis. Well, I'm not. I'm saying this way too quickly. Uh, the character Jing was originally used to write Gao, and in other words, so it had a bunch of different meanings. So they they felt the pressure to create a new character to reduce the amount of usages for the original character Jing so they added a ko to the bottom of Jing to get Gao um, so you you could almost think of it but it's not it's not doing the exact same job as as what, what we're talking about in Cantonese um, yeah so any anyway, also the uses of that ko is very. Um, it's not. I mean, of course, this is a dialectal dialectical writing. 
distinguishing mark. John has corrected me. A distinguishing mark. Uh, but this ko thing in Cantonese is very, uh, how do I say this? It's, it's not standard. I mean, there's not a, well, there isn't a standard for one, but, but even, even the de facto standard is not always used. And like, like for me, I'm old enough to remember back when it was difficult to represent characters on computers, at least, well, I, I think everywhere, but for, uh, for Westerners especially. But in Hong Kong, they would, they'll, they would, so yeah, they would write those characters that you now see oftentimes with, with the ko. They would write the character without the ko because they probably didn't know how to type the one with the ko. Or sometimes they would actually use an English lowercase o and then the character. So they would add their own ko <laughs> to it. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting how that, that stuff evolved. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to diverge too much. I, I love Cantonese, so I, I love talking about it. Uh, but I don't want to <clears throat> continue. Just I don't want to just talk about that. No, actually, I, I would like to, but maybe on a different uh, um, webinar. Uh, not webinar. Live stream. Okay. So looking back at this entry for Zhang. Uh, if you look down, okay, so at the, at the very beginning, you see this, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor or not, but Yang Zhao, and Yang is the rhyme, so Ang, basically, and Zhao is the initial, so the Zhi. Um, so in here it's saying Zhang Du Wei. Du Wei, uh, I think that's also Zhang, yeah. Du Wei Zhang, so this Zhang is read as this Zhang. And if you look at the text here, you'll see these uh, parentheses. And so what, what it, the parentheses means is, they're right, so the character in front of the parentheses is what gets written, and the character inside the parentheses is what the person meant. <laughs> That makes sense. So they write fan, but what they really mean is return, because they're basically they're just writing sound in other words. And then this this one might be surprising for people, but so ru, they actually mean na. And so in, in Mandarin, r comes from an earlier ny. That's a clue that. They're, these, these sounds are actually related. I mean, the ancient sounds were actually really close, even though they don't seem like they would be from a Mandarin perspective. Um, yeah, so they wrote ru, but they meant they meant na. And here they wrote this gene, but they mean this gene. And then they wrote zhang, <laughs> but they actually mean the zhang with the yu pang. Uh, I got another note here. Let me check it out. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and answer this question real quick. But the questions, future questions, I'm gonna wait until the end of the section because uh, otherwise we're not gonna make it through this. But somebody's asking. Um, Do you have any advice for me, Ash? I believe I'm in a race against time to learn Chinese. I noticed that all the native-like speakers start at age 18 to 22. And I believe at around 25, 26, neuroplasticity significantly reduces. Um, yeah, so this isn't totally related, so I'll, give it, I'll try to give a really short answer. The short answer is, yes, you can do it. And you need to get good at, um, What's it called? Coursing. Uh, I'm 50, and you know I started learning Japanese. Well, I'm not doing it right now, but I'm writing my dissertation. But I was learning Japanese like a year or two ago, and I can get the pronunciation pretty good. And it's it's not about 
this neuroplast this neuroplasticity isn't something you need to worry about. I mean, it's not it's a thing, but it's not a thing that can't be overcome. Uh, and I know because I've overcome it. <laughs> so, and not only do I know that I have, but I know a bunch of other people that have, and I know people that started. Well, actually, most people I do know are from that time period. Well, John, I think John learned in his mid twenties. I don't think he was twenty-two when he started. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, there's a guy named um, Ola Ola Klein. He he has two PhDs. One of them in, I think some kind of biology or, or neuroscience and the other one is in has to do with at least in some level with linguistics like he, he he's he's a big proponent of coursing and um, anyway he's in his 70s and he's learning languages all the time and from what I under, I, I don't remember if I've seen him pronounce things but I'm I, having read his stuff and the way he goes about trying to learn the pronunciation uh, I would think that he pronounces it really well. I mean, you could also check out our our um, pronunciation course because it gives you all these. We we show you how to how to pronounce things. We give you all the tools you need to get a native speaker accent. Um, but don't. I mean, you're not really in a race for time with time. It's not. It's really not. Um, you, you can get a native like level now. I mean, even if I. I'm 50, and I, I can tell you this, the next language I learn after Japanese, I'm going to have a native-like accent because I'm going to do the stuff it takes, and I, I already know what the techniques are to do, and my, my age isn't going to stand in my way. So, uh, anyway, yeah, that should cover it. So, uh, please feel free to ask other questions, but I'm going to try to get through this. Yeah, William, Dr. William Baxter is learning, or he's been learning Japanese for the past couple of years, and he's he's in his 70s. I don't know. Um, I don't know how old he is exactly. I know he's probably mid-70s by now. Um, okay, so it so so I actually chose this particular entry on on purpose because. If you look at it, you'll notice that there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, okay. Let's let's just look at this first sentence actually. So this first sentence has four characters in it. All of them are tongja. Not a single one of them is being used. Uh, well, I mean, maybe they're not all tone. I, I, it, it depends because it sometimes the tone jaw could mean that, say, this character Gene was used in this particular uh, ding, which is a type of cauldron, I guess. This gene was used because this other gene hadn't, with the Yuzupang, hadn't even been invented yet. So that that that's also a possibility. But but basically. There's four characters, all four of them are Tongjia. And then this next sentence has uh, six characters, and one of them, or actually two of them is Tongjia. This this one, the bean is marked, but the Zhang isn't, but the Zhang is also Tongjia. And then this next one here, you, there's three out of two, ten characters, there's three of them that are Tongjia. So, if, and if you if you look at like excavated text research, I mean it's not uncommon at all for a sentence to have seventy or eighty percent tongjia. So this tongjia thing is very very prevalent in preaching text, which is good for us because it tells us a lot of information about uh, which characters sounded like other characters, and then also like I said in the previous video, there's two factors you always have to keep in mind and that's time and space so like if you wanted to really understand the tongja and this this thing i'm looking at you'd want to know the dates of these texts and then the locations that they were written 
Uh, unfortunately, we don't always know that. Usually, like, with an excavated text, you know where it was found. And then, based upon where it was found, and we know enough about excavated text to look at the character forms and think, oh, well, this might be Jin Guo or Chu Guo or whatever texts. So, anyway, we there's there's tons of... And this, this dictionary I'm showing you here is actually a fairly traditional... This is just, uh, I think this is mostly... Um, transmitted texts as opposed to excavated text. So transmitted text just means it's been copied over and over up until modern times. Although this here, if they're giving you something that's written on a on a the, on a bronze inscription, then it is doing more than just transmitted text. I'm not sure if bronze inscription I mean, that would probably be considered a excavated text. But they're talking about the Shuo one and the Chu Chu Right, so so these are, that was one, one tong, Tongjia dictionary, and then if you want to know more about Tongjia, this, this right here is kind of an intro textbook to it. Um, it's from a fairly traditional perspective, and this is kind of something you always have to keep in mind when you're, when you're trying to learn stuff about ancient things that You'll, you have a section of Chinese scholarship that tends towards the traditional and they don't readily accept newer ideas, uh, which is fine as long as you know that and you know how to interpret it. But you can tell people's attitude usually by things like the, the, the reconstruction that they use. Like, so in this particular book, they're using Wang Li. And Wang Li, I mean, that's <laughs> in terms of reconstruction, it's pretty ancient. Uh, and just looking at his reconstruction, it's pretty obvious that it's not that it's not likely to be very accurate. And the reason I say that is he'll have like if if you understand engineering and the concept of a transfer function, so a transfer function meaning well, if you're dealing with real systems, you'll have an actual equation, but you have an input and an output, and then you you don't really understand the system, but you you can map your inputs to your outputs if that makes sense and if you look at Wang like Wang Li's old Chinese reconstruction for one the, the number of vowels involved is just crazy I mean it's every word has like three or four vowels in it and it's just not likely at all that <laughs> there's that much vowels vowelness going on and then also it looks kind of like a dialect of uh, middle Chinese and I'd already thought that myself and I was sitting in on a PhD um, defense and the guy giving his defense was asked by one of the professors if he also looked at Wang Li and he, and he said no because it looks like a dialect of middle Chinese to me <laughs> and so I thought that was pretty cool since that's my impression as well of course could also be confirmation bias but who knows so then you have these other Tong Tongjia dictionaries, uh, like so. This Bai Yulan, this one is for excavated texts. Um, yeah, so that, that that gets into some really. You want to see where like almost all characters are Tongjia. Like, look at that one. This one here is the one that I just showed you an entry from. This Li uh, Chunzhi. This isn't actually a dictionary. She, she's basically doing a, doing research on Tongjia, specifically within Chujian. And Chu Guo spoke a different language than, say, Qing Guo. And, you know, how different is it? You know, I don't really know. Um, I, I've actually got books on Chu Guo phonology and stuff, but I haven't, like, devoured them or anything. Um, but anyway, even if like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with San, San Min, but if you want to buy Chinese books from Taiwan, these are two really good websites. And if you get, if you just get on one of these websites and do a search on, on Tongjia, you'll see, you know, there's a lot of stuff come up. 
Okay, so now we're, we're back to this Cantonese question again. Um, and actually, to my point earlier about kou, the the mm, mm, actually, this character actually pre-exists Cant. Oh, well, I don't know. Pre-exists Cantonese. That's a philosophical question, not ready to answer, but it definitely. It definitely pre-exists uh, modern Cantonese writing, as does this one here at the end. But, but the statement that was made is also correct. When you when you have these characters and they do have the codes of the it is a signal to you to interpret it as, as a sound rather than as the you know, like say the meaning of the the right side in this case, which would mean I. So this is an actual sentence that my Cantonese tutor wrote me back when I was actively learning Cantonese like a long time ago. <laughs> but it says Lei Sheng Sheng Hoi Tai Heya. And I was reading this and it was like, you want, not want, go, body, play. Uh, but then I, I knew that hey in Cantonese actually means movie. And then I thought about, oh, Tai. This character is pronounced Tai, which is which is the same sound and the same tone as the word to, to look, or at least one of the words to look. So like in uh, Mandarin, you say Kan. Kan uh, Kan 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 And Kan isn't really used as much in Cantonese. Like sometimes if you have like a word like a, like, a set word like kan fa. You could say hon fa. I don't know. You could also say tai tai fa, tai fa. I think. Uh, but the the point is, you're reading along, and then you get to this thing here that doesn't make sense. That's also a clue to tell you think of it in terms of sound. And so that's what I did, and then. Can't, that, that word Thai is usually written this way, uh, but I think my, this is in the early 2000s, so I don't think my, this is back, <laughs> this is back when you had to worry about Big Five in, in Guobiao, so uh, yeah. She didn't know that you could type this in Big Five, essentially, so she used this character. But that's fine. I mean, that's the way it works. That's the way written Cantonese works. So written Cantonese be is very simple. And in fact, it's so simple that, like in Hong Kong, nobody learns to write written Cantonese. Not that I'm aware of. No. But everybody knows it. They can just intuitively read it. And the reason is... It's very simple. If you see something, it doesn't make sense, think of it in terms of sound. And then, boom, you got it. Now, when you get to Mi Nan Hua or Tai Yu, it gets really complex. And here's why. They don't just, they don't, for, for one, people in Taiwan do not go to school learning Mi Nan mean non pronunciations of characters. So they might speak mean none, but they don't know unless they go out and learn it somewhere or somebody teaches them, they don't know how to write mean non hua using Chinese characters. So so there's several ways that it ends up happening. One is they'll do what the Cantonese do, they'll use a different in fact I think actually that's quite rare. But they could they if the, if it was somebody who actually knew the mean nine pronunciations of characters, they might use a different character with the same pronunciation. But that's not what normally, I think what normally happens is they use a character that has the same meaning. So like, if you've ever heard of a uh, Wu Bai, and Wu Bai is, uh, he's a Taiwanese singer. He's got some really, I mean, I, I like his music. He's like one of the, one of the, when I first got into Chinese music, I really didn't like most of it, but I wanted to listen to it because of the Chinese, and then, but his stuff, actually, their songs, I'm like, hey, 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 I actually like this song. But, Wu Bai, he's, um, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a Taiwanese speaker, and he writes a lot of his songs in, in Mi Nan Hua. And, uh, in one of his songs, 
they're saying the word gong, like in, in Minam Hua to say, I'll, let me tell you, or I'm, I'll tell you, it's like, Wakali gong. And like, if you just walk around in Taiwan, you'll hear that phrase like a lot. It's, people say that a lot. It's kind of a, kind of a go to phrase. And they wrote the Wakali gong, and gong. They wrote it as Shuo Hua de Shuo. Uh, but it's clearly not Shuo Hua de Shuo. It's clearly Jiang Hua de Jiang. And in, in fact, in Cantonese, you say gong, 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 dong, wa. Gong is written also jiang, uh, which is how I knew that it actually should be also jiang if you're writing gong in, in Taiwanese. Then there's yet another way, which actually makes the thing way more messy, is uh, they also write Taiwanese. I mean, yeah, they write Taiwanese based upon Mandarin pronunciation. So they try to approximate the Taiwanese sounds with Mandarin pronunciation. And so if, if you're reading a type, for instance, if you're on Facebook and you're reading a Taiwanese person's blog post and there's like this string of just complete nonsense characters, what's what you're really looking at is they've written a sentence that if you read it out loud in Mandarin, it should be similar enough to Taiwanese, although it will definitely most certainly not be the same. You cannot actually, it's not actually possible to accurately write Taiwanese with uh, Mandarin pronunciation because the languages have very different phonologies and the Minanhua actually has way more sounds in it than Mandarin does. <clears throat> so it's not even possible to do that. Um, But why is this important? Why, why, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, what it has to do with what we're talking about is that these things happened in ancient times as well. So if we're armed with the knowledge of how modern dialects treat characters and the types of things they may or may not do, that gives us a good idea on how to interpret these ancient texts, or at least gives us uh, lines of... Um, questioning that we can ask ourselves or you know ways of thinking about the text to see if, if like I use this one way or this other way which one makes sense um, so actually so <laughs> I'm gonna go against what I said somebody asked somebody asked uh, some a question about this Hokkien stuff so okay what, I, what I'm saying mean Nanhua this language actually has a bunch of different names to it which is very frustrating like for me when i first tried to i mean i don't speak it by the way i know some phrases here and there and i know how to pronounce a couple characters but i, I don't speak minahua um but i i do own a lot of textbooks on how to learn it and there's just a gazillion different names so in 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 malaysia or singapore it's called Hok, hokkien which is just the Hokkien pronunciation of Fujian. Uh, but see, calling it Fujian Hua isn't super accurate either because there's a ton of languages in Fujian province. Um, so Hokkien is what they call it. They also call it Amoy Hokkien. And, and Amoy is actually Xiamen, uh, which is a part, I think it's a city, actually. It's a city in Fujian province. So that you have, they call it Amoy Hokkien. And actually, if you do, if you ever look at FSI courses, the, there is an FSI Amoy Hokkien, Hokkien course, and it's actually Baxter's, uh, Dr. Baxter's professor, Bodman, Nicholas Bodman, who did that course. And he's actually a famous, or rather well-known historical, I mean, famous within the circles of historical linguistics or Chinese historical linguistics. Okay, so what are my thoughts? Oh, so real quick, the names that you'll come across are Minan, Minan Hua. And if you're in Taiwan, they'll call it Tai Yu, or some people call it Ho Lo Wei, which is, that's a whole nother story. Um, and then you have, yeah, so basically Hokkien, Amoy Hokkien, so you could say that in Mandarin as Fu Jian Hua, uh, Minan Hua, or Taiyu, in if you're in Taiwan.
Yeah, those are the ones that come to mind. I'm sure there's more because it's, it's a, got a lot of names. Uh, so what are your thoughts on written representation of Hokkien, characters versus romanization? Um, <clears throat> personally, I like the character representation. In, ta in Taiwan, you have basically three Shia um, Pai, like three groups of thought or three schools of thought, I guess. One of them is use all characters. Another one is use all romanization. And then another one is mix the two. Uh, the one I like the least is mixing the two. Like it just looks, I mean, it's from an aesthetics perspective. It's not from a language representation perspective, but from an aesthetics perspective, it looks awful to me. Um, and, and, and then there's also problems with the, the character the character people, the people that are just doing it for all characters, they're very concerned with the concept of ban zi, and basically meaning what was the original character used to write this word, you know, and there may or may not be a character at all, which is actually why the middle group, the ones that mix romanization and characters, is they use characters if they know the ban zi, and if they don't, they use romanization. And in the character group, sometimes, man, some of the characters they choose to use just is kind of an odd uh, choice. I mean, they're usually not characters that are used in Mandarin, which is fine if you just pick a couple of them. Like Cantonese has some characters that don't appear in Mandarin, but, but a lot of times Cantonese, they just use characters that already exist. And that has the advantage of being easier to learn, like taking less effort to learn it. So if you get the all character stuff in, in Minanhua, sometimes it's just, man, it's really bizarre looking. Um, of course, that's a, you know, you get used to it if you read it, but it, it, I think it's, it'll work against it ever becoming popular. Uh, three, the third one being all romanization. I mean, I don't really like it, but there seems to be a lot of political motivation behind that, like trying to separate from China. And I, I can understand why people would want to do that, but for me, it's not about politics, it's about just the language stuff. Um, so I, I prefer the character stuff, though I'm not, I'm not opposed to the other, but it's a very, uh, the whole thing's very politically charged, both in China and in Taiwan, but for different reasons. So anyway, yeah. Um, Another question, shouldn't we expect that in Middle Chinese times and earlier dialectical differences would be even more pronounced than today due to people moving around much less? Huh. That's actually, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of people, including myself, I originally, you kind of, people, especially me, I'm, I, I tend towards idealism a lot of times in my thinking, so I have to actually actively counteract that. But a lot of I, I, I've seen people online and stuff and they, and they think, oh, well, Chinese started back, you know, 5000 years ago. So back then there weren't any dialects. And then the dialects kind of appeared over time. But that's not really what happened. There was no pure moment where this thing called Chinese, you know, just appeared. It was you got people living in an area and then there's people on the sides of this area speaking different languages and there there's these different influences that are kind of influencing i guess <laughs> influencing these so so like these different languages well i mean even in old chinese there were definitely dialects and it had to do with the area you lived in like you're saying but also has the area you live in isn't just because you live in an area but it's also because a certain area is more likely to be influenced by like, like for instance, if you if you go to the border of Vietnam and, like, I'm gonna show my geographical ignorance here. I think Vietnam borders on China. I know what Vietnam looks like. I know what China looks like, but I very I've never gone to actually look at the actual border. But I'm pretty sure they border. But it like Cantonese actually sounds a lot more like Vietnamese than than let's say, you know, Beijing Hua. And and the reason is is it's called aerial contact you know they're they're in the same place so if i'm living down and of course i'm not this isn't the old chinese situation the ge geography is much this is different 
but I'm just using the modern modern China situation as an analogy. But if I'm living in Guang in down, I'm assuming Guangzhou borders on Vietnam. I don't know, but say it does. If I'm living down there, I'm just naturally even if TV didn't exist. I'm, I'm naturally more likely to come into contact with a Vietnamese speaker than I would with, say, a Mongolian speaker. And if I lived up in northern China, I'd be much more likely to come in contact with Mongolian speakers. And it, it's got nothing to do with... It's, it's not per se attached that, to that geographical area or the fact that I've lived there with a group of like people for a long time. It just has to do with the fact these other people also live there. And because we're in close proximity, we're more likely to talk to each other and therefore influence each other. So you do have dialects and they are pronounced and I've heard Baxter say that the dialect situation in old Chinese is more complex than the modern situation now I, I don't know if that's true or not and I haven't looked into it and I don't know I didn't ask him why he said it he could be just meaning that the sounds are more different from one another uh, I find it hard to believe that it's actually more complicated because the modern situation is really rather complex I think. Um, but yeah, people moving around much less. Well, people moving around also... I, I'm not sure they moved around. I mean, there was a lot of migrations going on. And, and I mean, if you look into like Sino-Tibetan, for instance, and you read about that, one of, one of the reasons Sino-Tibetan linguistics is much harder than, say, European linguistics is because the political borders weren't as stable like in Europe in Europe it's very easy to trace you know French and, and Italian and Romanche and uh, Spanish back to Latin and we also know a heck of a lot about the politics that were going on in those places but in in the Sino-Tibetan areas the the politics are less clear the situation's less clear, and there were a lot of migrations going on. Um, but it sounds like... Okay, so let me... There's, Like I said earlier, you always have to take two variables into account when you're talking about this, so time and space. And so you're talking about space here, right? So I'm, I'm stuck in this small area, and I don't travel from this small area, say, across a mountain range to another group of people and, and maybe initially it was the same group of people but we got in an argument about which side of the mountain to live on and we chose one side and other people chose the other side yes our our language is going to diverge and between time and distance factors time is more important so people staying in the same area for longer periods of time is going to end up with more linguistic variation than say and in, in, in this and you can see this in modern times America is much larger than England, but the, the linguistic diversity in America isn't as large as linguist, linguistic diversity in England or the, in the UK. And the reason is people have been in, in the UK or what, what we call the UK now, this, this geographic area. People have been in this area speaking some version of English for much longer than there have been people in, the, in the, what we call the US speaking English. So the divergence is much, the divergence in England is, is like you go over to the next town and you might not be able to talk to anybody. Tours in the US, that's not gonna be the case. I mean, there are cases like my, my grandparents are from rural Mississippi. And if you were to take rural Mississippi, my grandfather, in other words, take him in the 1950s and throw him in the middle of New York City, he would have had a hard time communicating with people uh, because that's before TV was super popular. And before, so the standard English wasn't as prevalent as it is today. And that's, a, that's one of the big effects of TV and mass media is, is language standardization. So how can we talk about something like Middle Chinese as a single entity and try to reconstruct it from different written sources? Okay, well, that's, that's another good question. Yeah, so, you know, what middle, what is, in fact, I talked about this a little bit last time, you know, what is middle Chinese, right? Um, and the answer is, nobody's 100% sure what middle Chinese is. 
Um, I talked about the Chiayun last time, so it's a rhyme dictionary called the Chiayun, so like the splitting rhymes. And there's a preface to this dictionary, and it explains the process by which the dictionary itself was created. And it's basically, I think it was eight guys or six guys sitting around drinking wine, talking about how different characters are pronounced in different parts of China. Uh, so according to Baxter, what, what the Chiayun represents is something akin to, say, a modern American dictionary. And in the modern American dictionary, will make distinctions. Well, it'll show you all the distinctions. So, if, like, in my grandparents' English, the name Mary, like M-A-R-Y, they would say something like Mary, Mary, I think, Mary. And then M-E-R-R-Y, they'd say Murray, Murray Christmas. And then to get married, or married, I'm not really sure. But I do remember distinctly hearing that there, th there were three distinct words or distinct sounds. For me, they're all the same. I would say Merry, Merry Christmas because Mary got married. It's a Merry Christmas because Mary got married. They're all Merry to me. Um, so if I look at an English dictionary and it, and it makes these three distinctions between these words, what does that mean? And according to Baxter, what it means is the dictionary will distinguish all the distinguished, like they'll go around the country and they'll be familiar with different pronunciations of English. Well, actually, they'll probably just take the standard, what they would consider standard version of English. But even within the standard, there's going to be, there's going to be variation. So, so they're showing you all the possible distinctions that people make. But, but at the same time, it's not true that any one person is going to make all these distinctions. And which distinctions you make and not and you and don't make have to do with you know what part of the country you live in or what, maybe you've moved around but basically where you're where you live now in the modern in modern times it's more complicated because you have tv which acts as a kind of a break on li linguistic change and it also or it accelerates it also in some cases uh, but you have more of a standard that everybody hears all the time so, so going back to Middle Chinese, what does that mean? Well, I mean, so Baxter would say that the Chiayun actually represents all the distinctions made at the time, though it doesn't represent like one person's speech or even a city's, a group, a city's speech, right? Well, this is a very different idea than Carlgren. Carlgren thought that the Chiayun was based upon the speech of, I think, Luoyang or, or Chang'an or maybe both. At any rate, he thought it was a certain city. Um, so, Middle Chinese, you don't... Okay, so Middle Chinese reconstruction is going to be a lot different from Old Chinese reconstruction. Because the Qiayun is, is one of these things I talked about last week. It's, 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 a, it's direct evidence where somebody's telling you, Hey, this character sounds like that. This character over here rhymes with this character. These characters have the same initials. So that's actually telling us a lot of direct information about, it, the very least, the relationships between characters. And so if you're gonna do a, a middle Chinese reconstruction, written sources, I mean, if you, I don't know what you mean by that. If you're talking about like looking at a text written in, in middle Chinese, or if you're talking about like rhyme dictionaries, but you would, you would take, you would, I mean, you would do like a a a, 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 a recon you, you would do the comparative method on Chinese dialects, right? You and then and see if you can reconstruct Middle Chinese based upon these Chinese dialects, and then you also use what you know about the rhyme dictionaries or rhyme you know and for late for late Middle Chinese you have rhyme tables. Um, yeah, but but. I don't think a reconstruction of Middle Chinese in and of itself means, hey, this is the way everybody talked during the Middle Chinese period. I don't, I don't think it means that. I think it means this is how characters in standard written texts sounded or, or, or something, something close to that. Okay, at the same time, variants in written characters are widely acknowledged, but I don't see any information about past spoken dialects. 
Oh, but there is. I mean, what, what do you mean? I, I don't know what you mean by information about past smoking dialects. Do you mean information, ancient information we can use to reconstruct ancient dialects? Or do you mean... Uh, do you mean modern writings about ancient dialects? Because actually both exist. Uh, there's a Chinese class, a book, I don't know how you want to call it, classic a book called Fang Yan. And in this book, the author very clearly delineates dialects during, I think it's either, I think it's the Eastern Han period, but he, or maybe the Western Han period, but he, the, the author clearly says, in these cities, this word is pronounced this way. In these cities over here, the word's pronounced that way. And in this place over here, it's pronounced this other way. And South Coblin has a book called Eastern Han Sound Glosses. And in this book, he goes over this dialect information really, really, I mean, he's got a whole set of maps and all kind of stuff. So there's, that would be an example of modern writing about ancient dialects. There's also books about, um, like, like, Chu, like the Warring States, Chu Guo. Uh, there's definitely I've, got, I've I've actually owned several books about grammar and phonology of the, of that dialect. Um, so there's yeah, there's definitely a lot of dialect information, and there's also the fact that different texts come from different areas, and there are at least trends as to which use it. You know what what sound components get used to represent what, what words in different regions. See, so yeah, I have that too. Um, why is it that all dialect groups other than Min evolve from Middle Chinese rather than Old Chinese? Well, the, I mean, I'm not, okay. I'm just wondering if that's the correct way to think about. So, so let's start with the mean. There are sounds in mean which come from pre Han Dynasty. And the reason we know this is because we there's we, we know we know we have a bunch of uh, rhyming texts or poetry or you know certain types of prose also use rhymes we have evidence of how things rhymed in 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 han han dynasty chinese so if you read baxter 1992 like baxter's um the handbook of old chinese phonology he talks about that in in in, in that book where you know, in the in the Shi Jing, so in other words, in Old Chinese, these two characters rhymed, but by the Han Dynasty, they didn't rhyme anymore. And you know, how do we know that? By by doing systematic analysis of Han Dynasty rhyming text compared to the Shi Jing, right? Of course, then there's the question of what does the Shi Jing represent, <laughs> which is also not easy to answer. So we know about more more about the changes in rhymes than we know about initials but the rhyme changes between old chinese there are actually several books on this topic including coblin's book but there's also several books in chinese about han dynasty rhyming so we know we can compare mean mean rhyming to these han dynasty rhyming and and it shows that the mean dialects did not undergo the same changes that happened in these Han Dynasty uh, sources. Um, so we know that mean split off from the main group of Chinese dialects before the Han Dynasty. And we know that because of comparison to Han Dynasty rhyming and, and mean rhymes. Um, there's also, I mean, Baxter says this isn't evidence, but to me, I don't know why it isn't. But I'll, I'll tell you what I think is evidence, even though Baxter says it's not. But like, so take, there, there are a lot of, so in sounds like chu chu shu, uh, these are very modern sounds. Uh, they started, 
existing in Middle Chinese. They did not exist in Old Chinese. And so like Zhong from like Zhong Guo in Minanhua, it's still pronounced with the Old Chinese initial, which was D. So if you say Zhong Guo in, in Minanhua, it's, um, I'm probably not gonna get the tones right, but I think it's Diong Guo. Yeah, Diong, Diong Guo. So it starts with a D, Diong Guo, instead of Zhi. And like Cantonese is older, retains a lot of things that are older than Mandarin, although not always, but on average Cantonese retains older sounds than Mandarin. But it also, <coughs> Zhong Guo in Cantonese is Zhong Guo. So like it, the, they don't have the D either. So that's, and I'm pretty sure if you look at the Han Dynasty, it, it definitely if you look at the Qie Yun, which is 600 AD, if you look at the Qie Yun, Zhong is not pronounced with a D. It, it's probably something like DR or TR or something, maybe uh, erot eroticized R, I mean T or D. Uh, so yeah, that's why. And then, curious if you have any suggestions, opinions about when to start studying Chinese languages like Minan or Cantonese versus focusing on getting Mandarin to a high level first. Um, I mean, it depends on you and how good you are at I mean I, I personally okay so I've, I've learned you know I've, I've, I've attempted learning like a gazillion languages probably 10 or 15 uh, I speak English Mandarin and Dutch to uh, at a pretty high level English being my native language I speak Cantonese and German but all but at a much but at a significantly lower level than the other ones. And then like there's a there's some bunch of other ones that I, I, I like, for instance, I used to could uh, communicate in Swedish and Danish, though I was never like super fluent or anything. And then I, I know a bit about like Spanish and French. Like I know a lot about their grammars. Uh, I've also studied Russian and Czech. Um, so I, I, have a, I have a pretty wide view on these things. Uh, I've ja studied Japanese, studied some Vietnamese. Um, in my experience, if you're going to learn two languages at the same time, you're probably better off learning two languages that are quite different from one another. Because if you learn a bunch of stuff that's similar, I think it's easier to get confused. That's me, okay? So then you take Mike Campbell from Glossica, and <laughs> of course, he's, he's more of an outlier than we are, I think. But Mike learned all the Taiwanese aboriginal languages at the same time. And he was describing it to me one time and he said he, he would have like a, for each word, he had like a, a graph that was roughly based upon the geography of Taiwan. So he would like have a piece of paper where the top right corner was one language and it was always that same language. And then the one below it was actually literally the language that's geographically close to this other language. So he would, he would actually draw it on a map of Taiwan and then have it roughly geographically accurate where the, so it'd be the same word, but the different, how the different dialects said it. And that's his, that was his mechanism for keeping these similar things separate. Uh, I've never tried anything like that. Um, I've been in, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I could try something like that, but not while I'm in grad school. I need to get out of grad school first. And I, I've been in grad school since 2006. Um, yeah, for me, I put, I, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a big advantage to learning Mandarin first, even though personally I like Cantonese better. And the advantage is one that when you write, you write the way a Mandarin speaker talks, basically. I mean, it's not that simple, but it's more like that than a can how a Cantonese speaker talks. And there's a big advantage to being able to read and write standard written Chinese because pretty much all the dialect books that are teaching dialects are going to be written in either, oh, I mean, maybe English, but usually in standard written Chinese. Um, yeah, so practically speaking, I think pra it, 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 if you're not able to deal with learning a bunch of languages that are similar or even two other similar, then, holy man, 
I talk too much. <laughs> this stuff. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. So, I should probably get back to their presentation, but... Uh, yeah. Either find a way to distinguish these similar things so that you can keep them separate in your mind. Like, if you're... If you're speaking and they start bleeding together in your mind, that's a that's not a, that's a sign that you're doing something wrong. Like you either should wait to learn the other one, or you're not. Your your mechanism for keeping them separate in your mind isn't working. Now that's going to happen to some degree. Like I remember there was a there was an American guy at ICLP when I went there and he spoke Dutch actually quite well. So he and I would speak Dutch to each other, and I one time said to him. Tamen, Tamen Zeidefon. And he started laughing, and I didn't even know why he was laughing. Like, what, what's the funny? He goes, you just said Tamen Zeidefon. I was like, yeah? You just said Tamen Zeidefon. I was like, oh, so Zeidefon is Dutch, and Tamen is Chinese, and I didn't even know I was mixing them. That doesn't actually normally happen because Dutch is burned very deep in my soul. So, I, but it does happen on occasion. So, it, happening every once in a while is fine. If it happens all the time, obviously not fine. So, anyway, okay, that should answer the question. After I said I was going to answer questions, okay, so let's get back to presentation. Okay, jia uh, jie. This is it basically. It's it's kind of like permanent tong jia. So like, qi shi the qi was originally a, a picture of a basket, and it meant basket, and it got borrowed by sound to mean it, he, she, and then that meaning took the character over. So they created a new character for the basket, and then like wo was originally a, a depiction of a weapon. And the name of the weapon sounded like the word for eye. Uh, it's very difficult to draw a picture to mean eye. So they just borrowed this thing by sound. Um, okay, we got a new question, but I just, I'll acknowledge that we got it, but I'm gonna go to the presentation and come back to the question. Uh, Yeah, so, so then they borrowed the character for that weapon to represent I, and then that meaning took over the character. So this is jia jie, right? But, but and it, it, as you can see, for these at least the first three jia jie I list, it's not really going to give us a lot of sound. Well, it does. It tells us, like, for instance, the qi, qi shi, the qi, the... The basket character is actually just has a zhu zi tao with that same qi under it and it's pronounced ji. So that tells us, you know, the information, the sound, that there's a probably a sound correlation between those two characters. Okay, then you have xie sheng. So you can do systematic studies of xie sheng series. And that's actually, for me, the whole reason I even got into old Chinese to begin with was to understand sound variation in Xie Sheng series. And that is a super fascinating topic. And there is just, you know, you get into Chinese and you think, oh, the sound component should sound the same as the character. And then you find all these sound components in, in characters that have this like really divergent looking pronunciations. Most of those can be, uh, if, you, if you know a couple of rules, most of those things can be rectified. Like I remember before I, I, I was giving lectures on learning Chinese before I got, I, before I became good at old Chinese and paleography and, but I was going from more of like a surface perspective and I was, I had this slide about difficult sound components and I used, uh, yeah, like also and archie the chie. And I was actually giving a lecture using my old slides. And I turned around and I looked at the sound series for Ye, which at every time I had looked at that same sound series before was complete nonsense and noise to me. 
But in the interim, since I had seen that slide last, I learned all this stuff about old Chinese phonology. And I started seeing a bunch of patterns I didn't know before. And I looked at the series, I'm like, huh, that actually does make sense. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, this, this Xie Sheng thing is extremely important uh, for knowing. Of course, you have to take into things in consideration like the sound relations in the Xie Sheng series aren't exactly from the same time period as, say, the Shi Jing. Uh, they might be off a little bit. So that you have to take stuff like that into account. Also, you have to take into account when a character was created. Um, like if you're looking at some variant from 600 AD, you can't obviously make any proclamations about old Chinese based on that. Or you can, but they'll just be wrong. Foreign proper names is annotated in Chinese. Yeah, this tells us uh, uh, a lot, or you know, it's 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 kind of scattered information. But if you study it systematically, there's things that you can learn. For instance, um, there's a very ex uh, famous example, and the the first one to talk about this, I'm pretty sure, was Li Li Fang Gui. But there's there's two things actually you can see in here. So this this Wu uh, Yi Shan Li is how they wrote Alexandria. The the Greek city Alexandria, how they how it was written in in Old Chinese. So the character, what we say now as Wu was actually also pronounced with a U in Middle Chinese, but in Old Chinese, it's pronounced as an A, right? So if I see, if, if, we, if we've already reconstructed or say, so in, okay. Old Chinese rhymes are called Bu. And so when you're talking about Old Chinese reconstruction, you're talking about the rhyme, you'll say, oh, this character is in this Bu. So U is in, Yu Bu. And in fact, so Yu is also a, it's, it's a umlauted Yu, but it's a, it's a U, you know, Yu, which actually comes from U in Chinese anyway, it comes from the medial mixing with the vowel. <coughs> so you see these, uh, almost everybody reconstructs Yu Bu as an A in Old Chinese. And at first that might seem weird, but then you come across this, uh, you come across this name for Alexandria written with the character that we now say U. So this tells us at least two things. One, we're probably right with this A, seeing how they use U to write the A from Alexandria. Two, we know that this way of writing the name probably comes, or not probably, it comes from the old Chinese period and not from the middle Chinese period. I mean, there are other possibilities, like we could be wrong, or reconstruction could be wrong. Uh, but, but actually this gives us confidence that it probably isn't wrong, because this exact bu was used to write A in an ancient text. So then there's another thing, look at this next character, which in Mandarin you say is E. And in Cantonese I think it's like ik or something, I'm going to look it up real quick. So in Cantonese, that character, of course, oh, yik, it's pronounced yik. Um, so th that would be weird if it was for Alex that they would write ayik, right? And if you, you know, get into reconstruction, well, let me, let me actually, let me look up. Let me, let me look this up and see what the Middle Chinese, the Middle Chinese is for this. Okay, so actually the Middle Chinese for what we say in Cantonese is yik, is actually yik. <laughs> okay, but in Old Chinese, 
Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go check out Baxter's Reconstruction. I meant to have this all ready, but... So the Baxter's reconstruction of this is lec so it's, it's like L umlaut K lec so going back to this place name it because actually the first time he was saying L in old Chinese it it's not as simple as all L's become Y's but some L's become Y's I didn't really believe it. It just seemed like, how can L become Y? I just, I just didn't really believe that. But then I found out in Korean, actually, what's pronounced when a character is pronounced with an L beginning in in Mandarin, and many times in Korean it's pronounced with a Y. So like the last name Li, which is actually my Chinese last name Li, is pronounced Yi or something like that in Korean. And when I found that out, oh, okay, if that sound change happened in Korean, well, obviously it could happen in some other language, so that's a pretty normal sound change. But then also, looking at this place name, um, we, we know that, so, Alec, I mean, that's, that's a very likely thing, right? If they're writing, if they're writing Alexandria, of course, it matters how they actually said that name in ancient Greek, but still you can see how having this place name written in characters during the old chinese period and then us knowing the name alexandria how that can give us confidence in our reconstructions yeah okay so i think i discussed variant characters already yeah actually i'm, I'm kind of writing the expert entry for uh, which is complicated and, <laughs> and very interesting. Um, so you have this character pronounced xie in, in Mandarin. And according to Liu Zhao, it's, it's a variant, or actually a fun hua zi, so a derived character of wan. And Right off the bat, Xie and Wan obviously seem like they couldn't possibly be related, but he gives a lot of variant character form evidence. So like here you have, um, this is the character Li, although we don't write it with this dot in the modern, in modern Chinese, but Li, which also you might not know at first glance, but Wan actually is a sound component for Li. And he's showing this textual, well, variance. So this is the same character used the same way. One, one over here written with Y and over here written with Xie. And then there's a different character, which also has, is used the same way in texts, but one has the Xie, the other one has the Li. Which actually the Li and Wan are also the same. Well, okay, so the character on the right can be written that way, it can be written without the Han thingy. It can just be written with the Wan, the Mi and the Wan. Um, so looking at like old Chinese phonology, first let's look at like Wan is sound component in Mai. Right, which seems kind of weird because one of them ends in an N, one of them ends in an I. But this is actually, this happens in sound series, like not all the time, but it definitely happens where, um, and in fact, you can see this in Cantonese, uh, where one of them ends in a nasal and the other ends in a, in a Rusheng ending. So like, or actually, I think I already have it. Oh, no, I was going to write it and didn't. Or maybe it's up here. No, I didn't. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just do it in real time. Um, like this is pronounced... Zam. Um, 
and this is T. So the ending here, you have a nasal M, which is the same place of articulation as P. So ma, pa, ma, pa. If you say those out loud, ma, pa, and then throw a ga, ma, pa, ga, you'll discover the ga is completely different place of the mouth as the ma, pa. This also happens with N and T, so na, ta. But if you say na, ta, you're, you're saying it in the same part of the mouth. And then also na, ga, na, ga, same part of the mouth. So these, when they end up in the same part of the mouth, what that really tells you is those they're very closely related sounds. So for one, ends with an N, and then my ends with T. And this S here interacted with a T and it, uh, it assimilated it. In other words, when one sound assimilates another sound, it, it means that it causes the other sound to become pronounced in the same part of the mouth as itself. So instead of t, s, it became more like s, right? And then just basically the, so the T actually, it doesn't disappear, it becomes this off glide. And then, yeah, so that's how these endings could match. And then how like one and Li can match is that so when Baxter writes these uh, brackets here, what he means is, I don't know if this is an R, it's either an R or anything that has the same reflection in Middle Chinese as an R. Um, so like if you look at the thing below it, it's also pronounced Li, but it's, they reconstruct it, reconstruct it as Murats. So it's, I guess what he's saying up here is that it's possible this thing had a prefix like, like this one below it, but that we don't have any evidence for the prefix, so we're, we're not gonna reconstruct it that way. Uh, though I think it's pretty likely it did have the prefix. And, and so basically, yeah, the prefix disappears. And like this, this kind of thing, is, I, I've given this example before, it's not exactly the same, so don't say, you know, it's not exactly the same, because I, I know it's not exactly the same, but this kind of thing happens, like in English, we have uh, enough, which in Dutch is genoeg, and in German is genoeg. So the English actually went from something like genoeg to genoeg, or genoeg, to our modern enough, and then alike was actually gelijk. It, uh, alike in Dutch is gelijk and is gleich in German. So we know that alike actually used to have a G in front of it and that became ye like and then alike. And so something similar could have happened here with the how this ma was dropped. Now also note that the ma would not have been emphasized because it's like a, a prefix. The root is the rat. Or I don't know if it's ruled R, but so this would be something like it would not it would not be marat. It would have been marat, and so the fact that it wasn't emphasized marat means that it's likely to drop off. And in fact, if you if you analyze how English, for instance, when we speak, we drop a lot of syllables. Like instead of saying I am going to go, we often say stuff like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. Uh, and if you analyze that kind of thing, you'll notice that syllables that get emphasized, like go in that case, you don't ever say, I'm gonna go. Because you, you, the, the go will never go to go, because go is emphasized. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go, I am going to, all those things, none of those are emphasized, so they all shrink. I'm gonna go, but go you cannot shrink. In the same way, the, Root of this word is rat, so when this word was pronounced, uh, it would have been pronounced with an emphasized rat, so marat. And so it's easy for this unemphasized prefix to drop off. Okay, we're getting short on time. Let me, let me kind of speed up here a little bit. Okay, rhyming text. Um, I, I've only got these two examples here, but it's really any rhyming text. And I mean, 
it's kind of funny just from a presentation perspective of just seeing the Shi Jing like this, but the, that's like a, like literally you can get a PhD in the Shi Jing in or probably several actually. Uh, a lot of the same questions that we've come over before because, you know, the two variables, time, place, you know, what place does it represent? What time periods? It was actually written over a 700 year period. So there was obviously sound change going on while the thing was being written. Um, you know, what does it represent? Was it all one language? Was it different languages? You know, what effect did the editors, later editors have? Did they add in late characters? You know, what characters was in the original when they originally wrote it down? Or more importantly, what word were they trying to express? Like, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in there. But, but we use these books, they, cause they have very distinct structures to them. And so you can go in and read the Shi Jing, and even if you don't know anything about poetry, you'll you'll start noticing the poet, the poetry ness of it. You'll you'll start seeing that there are structures that these poems or songs are written in, and so this tells us which which words rhyme. And so when you talk when you hear somebody talking about a bu in old Chinese, what they're really talking about. How, so how do I know which characters go into a bu, right? Well, what they did was they went and they marked all the rhyming words in the Shi Jing, and then words that rhyme with each other, and rhyme with, or, you know, and you can tie these together, but you, you take all the words that rhyme together, you throw those in a bu, and then you give it a name. So the bu from Old Chinese Reconstructions is, comes from rhyming in the Shi Jing. Now, now that's the basis of it, and that's historically how it, Evolved. I mean, it could be that, that people nowadays actually maybe use other texts like the Chu Tzu or something where they use these other texts to tweak their Bu. Uh, but, but basically the rhyming of Old Chinese we get from the Shi Jing. <clears throat> I've talked about this E1, the variance of text. And then we have a bunch of loan words which act very similar to the place names and proper names that get written in Chinese characters. So you have loan words, like during the Eastern Han Dynasty is basically when Buddhism made it to China, and then a lot of Sanskrit texts, and I personally don't know much about, I'm not Buddhist, I don't know much about Buddhism, but I do know that I think their scriptures were initially in Sanskrit, and a lot of these Buddhist words in Chinese sound kind of weird because they're actually not native Chinese words, but the words that were borrowed in from Buddha, uh, Sanskrit. <clears throat> so we know a bit about ancient Sanskrit and we can use what we know about ancient Sanskrit and then see how Chinese loan words were written, Sanskrit words were written in Chinese characters to know a bit about how those characters sound at that time. And then I, I mentioned dialects, dialect studies, um, so dialects, you know, there's a lot of residue from Old Chinese, Middle Chinese, and modern dialects. Okay, wow, I actually made it through. Okay, let's go and try to answer some questions with the time we got left. Um, I remember reading somewhere that Cantonese conserved consonants, including checked, the check tone from Middle Chinese, but Mandarin retained vowels and medials better. Um, okay, I'm, I, I have not studied this. Um, I'm, I have not studied this exact question in any kind of detail. What I have studied is, although it's been a while since I've looked at this closely, but probably 2012 or 13, back when I took historical phonology, uh, I had to, uh, we had to memorize all of the sound changes from Middle Chinese to Mandarin. And I've actually read several books on that topic and I've, I've looked at Middle Chinese to Cantonese, but I've not actually compared these two. So I, I don't, I'll give an answer, but I'm just telling you my background so you'll know how much of it to believe. <laughs> um, so, when you're saying conserve consonants and you talk about the check tone, which I call, you know, rusheng, I would actually call it entering tone. You don't have to call it that. That's just 
the, what I've seen it written as in English. I've also seen Czech tone, but to be honest, I normally read about it in Chinese. So I would call it Rusheng or Yapseng in Cantonese. Though, I, to be honest, I don't talk about this stuff in Cantonese. <laughs> I'm not that good at Cantonese to be able to do that. Uh, I mean, I could, it just wouldn't be very, wouldn't be very smooth. I'd have to stop and think about the characters and think about how do you say that in Cantonese. Um, so, Cantonese definitely keeps the Rusheng endings, uh, but Mandarin retained vowels and medials better. I, okay, so I, I, I can think of examples where this is true, like, we're talking about yang bu. And so, like, in, Can in Mandarin, you still say tai yang, and it's still ang, right, which is what it was in Old Chinese. And in this, and there's a lot of, of yang bu in Cantonese that's pronounced yang, like gam yang, or gam yang. So that yang is actually a changed sound when compared to Old Chinese. So that would uh, fit your theory or fit the way you're saying this. And as far as medials, there are cases where the medial mixes with the initial in, in um, like, uh, well, that's not gong, jiang, jiang. I'm pretty sure river is pronounced jiang. Towards in manner is jiang, so the medials in Cantonese seems to have mixed with the initial jiang, or maybe maybe it's what caused the change of the main vowel jiang. Yeah. Okay. That might be true. <clears throat> I know there's this guy Andrew who might actually even be watching who he actually created a language. As far as I know. But somebody just Harvey described this to me one time, and I think what he said was he used Mandarin or, or used Cantonese when Cantonese retained the Middle Chinese, and he used Mandarin when Mandarin retained Middle Chinese. So basically, he created this language out of these two other languages to help him remember Middle Chinese, I think. But anyway. Andrew would probably be much better at answering this question than me because I, I haven't done that level of uh, research into it, to this comparison aspect. Okay, do we know that far enough? Do we know that far enough in the past, like the Shijing times, people had the same idea about rhymes that we do now? Maybe they had very different ideas about what sounds right. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, in fact, it, it's, it's actually even more complicated than that. So, what happens... What? In Cantonese? I'm gonna look that one up. Oh, it is. Gong. That's so bizarre. How did I think it was Jim? That's weird because, like, the sound component makes 100% sense there, but for some reason I didn't think it did in Cantonese because I would actually use, because in Minanhua, the, those two, the sounds between Gong and Jiang. I think they're both gong, if I remember correctly. Huh. I've been saying that wrong in Cantonese for years. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for pointing that out. Uh, so, anyway, back to this question. Uh, I mean, intuitively, you're going to think that no matter, no matter what your ideas about rhyming are, you're, you're going to have rhymes that are dead center rhymes, and then you have rhymes that are just, you know, you kind of force them to be rhymes. I think the dead center rhyming part is probably, especially with Chinese, I mean, it's, it's different when you're talking about a language with, a bunch, with like a bunch of syllables in the word. But when you're talking about like the Shijing, you're talking about mostly like single syllable words. 
So the, I mean, they're gonna rhyme. But then, but there's definitely cases in the Shijing where you're like, you look at these two things, you're like, how could those things possibly rhyme? And there's different answers. They're not. It's not always the same answer for those cases. I mean, it could be. It could be that. The, it's a textual area where, the, where it was copied wrong. It's not the correct character that's supposed to be there. It looks like a character that sounds... It looks like another character, and that other character is obviously the one because the, the sounds match, and it's, and it's in a rhyming spot in the text. But it could also be stuff like... Um, maybe you got the structure wrong. You know, it, it doesn't really rhyme. You just think it rhymes. But, I mean, even if you, if you listen to rap... And I, I, I don't I don't listen to it that much. I listen to some. But there are definitely times when people are rapping that you're like, yeah, that doesn't really rhyme. <laughs> but they use it in the rhyme. They use it anyway. There's also times where people actually break a rhyme. In fact, they do this in the Shijing, is they'll actually purposely break a rhyme. And the, and the reason they're doing that is to bring attention to the thing. Because when you, when you break a rhyme, your attention... In fact, in fact I, I've told this story probably on more than one video, but I'll, I'll tell you, because it's kind of a, a, along these same lines. I discovered that, and I didn't discover this until I was in Taiwan. I was probably, I was probably 12, 13 years ago when I discovered this, but I, so I, was, in my, I was in my 30s before I knew that I said the English word G-E-T in a non-standard way. <laughs> And the way I discovered this was, uh, I was recording some English rhymes. I mean, not, I'm not I wasn't trying to rhyme. I was just saying a bunch of words that rhymed together to so that uh, my Taiwanese English students could practice their English pronunciation by saying words that had the same vowel, basically. And but I was reading this list of words, and I was like, "Set, bet, met, get." Wait, what? <laughs> And it was the first time in my life that I realized get is supposed to rhyme with set, bet, met. But I would never say get. Like, I mean, it just sounds completely wrong to my ears. And more importantly, it sounds un-Texan, which I'm, I'm just not willing to go there. Uh, but the point is that when, when I broke that rhyme, I didn't do it on purpose, but when the rhyme broke, my attention was uber-focused on that sound. And so, artists who are masters, you know, like breaking a rhyme on accident is not considered mastery, but you, you hear a lot, if you see movies about people learning art or maybe taking art classes, you basically learn the rules so that you can break them. And I think rhyming is the same thing. So, breaking a rhyme on accident makes you look stupid, but if, if you break a rhyme on purpose, then you're a genius. Now, if you're actually breaking on purpose or not, you know, that's that's a whole other discussion if you're the idiot or the genius, but painters do this, you know, they have rules and how you're supposed to make paintings and, and they'll go against these rules on purpose in certain ways. So yeah, that, that, that would definitely apply to rhyming back then. But man, there's been a lot, a lot of research on rhyming in the Shijing and it goes back hundreds of years. Uh, I think the guy that, that you want to read now, if you want to read up on this in Chinese, is Chu Chu Wanli. I think that's right. Uh, yeah, I, that's who Baxter uses actually. And ba Baxter actually, in his 1992 book, the uh, Handbook of Old Chinese Phonology, he actually lists out all of the Shijing rhymes, so you can you can go in and you can see what he thinks all the rhymes are and he, he basically goes he goes by he goes by Chu Wan Li um, maybe he tweaks that sometimes I don't know I, I, I've not actually gone through and, and I, I actually I, I have personally gone through the Shu Jing and marked all the rhyming words because I had to do that for a class I took um, and then we had to show Li Fang Gui's uh, Reconstructions, but we had to actually go through and mark them all and turn the book in at the end of the semester. Uh, so yeah, I've done that before. Um, I think for the vast majority of the rhymes in the Shijing, that it's pretty obvious, and and the, and the, and the way the reason it's obvious is because of the way the text is written. Uh, like they'll use the same, they'll like say a, 
之所以 b。C 之所以 D, E 之所以 and I'm not saying they actually say 之所以 It's just like something easy for me to remember. But there, there's like the same three characters, and then there's different characters on either end of these three or four or five. It doesn't have to be three.、Uh, but if you if you read the actual text, you'll see it's pretty it's pretty obvious that they're rhyming. But but yeah, I don't think anybody's making the the claim that we understand that rhyming 100. I, I'm sure. There's some fringes around the edge, around the edges of our knowledge that aren't correct, and it probably has to do with not understanding exactly what they thought about with rhyming. But I think for the core of the rhyming, I think it's fairly obvious.、Uh, and another thing that's very interesting is apparently they don't have、uh, rhyming in Japanese. Like I tried to talk to this Japanese girl about rhyming, and like she just had no idea what I was talking about. And I even would, you know, I said a couple of rhyming words in English, and she still didn't get it. And I looked it up later, and apparently that's a thing. Like, so it makes me—I haven't heard any Japanese rap, but I'm kind of curious as to what they do, like, what they do to make it seem like song lyrics. So anyway, okay, we're we're getting to the end of this thing.、Um, if any more questions, a quick question I can answer.、Um, thank you guys for showing up. And give me a chance to talk about all this, man. This is、uh, <laughs> taking this is taking way longer than I, I I kind of anticipated to go through all four types of evidence in one video, and it seems like we're doing one type per video. Um, which I, I guess that's okay. Just、uh, yeah, as long as you guys like it, <laughs> I guess that's all. That matters. All right. Well, John hasn't.、Um, Given me any new questions, so I guess、uh, we'll call it quits, and then next time I'll go over. Next time I'll go over the secondhand data, so the evidence external to Chinese. Uh, which is basically loan words in other languages, characters borrowed in other languages like Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and phonology of nearby languages. And so ends.